Good morning, everybody. My name is Mark Dowling. I'm the Chief Executive Officer here with the Inland Valleys Association of Realtors, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Mr. Bruce Norris. Most of you are probably very familiar with Bruce. Bruce has been a longtime uh, activist, housing expert. Uh, he has been a community leader, radio host, uh, dealing with uh, issues in the real estate market, and he's been a frequent speaker at IVAR for many years. Um, he's also very involved in a variety of charities in our community. He's an outstanding uh, uh, leader. His son, Aaron, all of you uh, probably know him as well. And today we're going to have an open dialogue. We're going to talk to him about some issues that are going on. Obviously, it's uh, an interesting time, certainly in the real estate market and where we are as a country as well. Um, if anybody has questions, you can participate. There will be Q&A, and you can see probably at the bottom of your screen, you can type questions in. And over the course of the conversation with Bruce, I will ask questions of Bruce and we will have those uh, presented. So with that being said, let me get started and kind of go with the first question for Bruce, which is, uh, do you have an easy answer as to what's going on in the market right now? <laughs> and keep it short. I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> you know, what's going on in the market, I think in all of our minds is we're, we're a little bit shocked. Yeah. And we're reminded every day that life isn't normal. Oh, I, you know, I think I'll turn on a ball game. Oh, oh no, I won't. I'll go get a haircut. Uh, oh, no, I can't. I mean, gradually those things will return to normal, but we're reminded every day that it's not normal. And I think we all want, we all want normal to show back up. But how long that takes is really, really interesting. So, you know, all of the agents that deal with the public, whether it be listings that are saying, okay, we're not going to list the house, obviously, that's one of the charts, if you look at your report or look at car data, a lot of listings are not year over year are way down. They're just, okay, kind of frozen. We don't know what to do. But time on market is very short. So you have people that have to buy or want to buy making those decisions pretty quickly. So I think it's fair to say we've never seen anything like this. The unemployment chart, I just did some calculation before I joined you. I think by mid-June, you'll have 25% unemployment, which is a great depression level. So let's, let's get to the inventory question maybe in a minute, but let's first talk about the unemployment issue because let's face it, in the housing market, if you're a realtor and you're working with buyers and sellers, um, it's important that people have jobs because if you don't have a job, it's hard to buy a house. And yeah. as you said, we're dealing with a situation where we have over 40 million people have filed for unemployment in the last 10, 11 weeks. Yes. Um, and I'm hearing that a number upwards of 35 to 45 percent of those people may not have a job when things, quote, go back to normal. Yeah. How, how do you see the economy absorbing this change and over the next 6, 12, 24 months? That's a scary thought to think about that. But there's, you know, there's a lot of jobs, you know, in the last six weeks, I've been I've had to go back and forth to a lot of on a lot of trips and go through different airports and land in Florida quite a bit. And, and to see how Florida is looking as compared to California, just to, it, it was interesting to observe that they progressed more, more toward normal more quickly. But every time I was in an airport, like in Ontario, the first time I went about five weeks ago, there was no one. There was one flight and you're just going, oh my God. So yeah, so you've got a lot of concerns when you've got unemployment that's going to be persistent because you've got, well, not just buyers and sellers, you have people with payments and you have people with rents. So those are really important decisions that have to be made. So you've got whatever the unemployment lands on, it's, it's probably going to improve from 25% to some number, but you're right. A lot of those jobs are not coming back because a lot of businesses can't survive with partial openings, if you will. If you own a restaurant, and one of the things in Florida, so I was already at a restaurant probably 10 days ago in Florida, but every third booth was available to be sat in. Well, okay, well, th that just wiped out your income potential. You still need a cook and you still need people to serve, but your profit margin is gone. You could see a lot of those types of businesses not reopening which means they're not going to pay the rent to their owner of the building, et cetera. There's a lot of dominoes. Right. So right. now what's really important is how the lenders react to people's inability to pay payments. 
is that going to be a foreclosure glut? Doesn't look like it. And that's really important. If you don't have a foreclosure gut, you, glut, you probably avoid price damage. They're all even talking like a, like a holiday on missed payments, so it doesn't affect your FICO score. Right, okay. Right. I mean, all of these things are really important decisions going forward where you still have a group of qualified people that can ev eventually get a yes answer from a lender. If you played none of these games and said, okay, it's business as usual, uh, that would be a big problem. Right, right. So in 2007, 2008, 2009, we saw the housing market essentially collapse here in, in much of California, particularly Southern California. Can you maybe explain why this downturn is going to be different? We're going to see high unemployment, but the housing market is a different market today than it was 10, 12 years ago. Can you talk about some of those differences and why this one's going to play out? Um, in, in a different fashion. Yes. For the last 10 years, we've had actually people qualify for loans. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, gosh, what a shocker, right? They actually put down payments and have low interest rates, fixed rates. So no one has a, a jumbo surprise coming. Two years from now, their payment's going to change and jump by 50%. There's none of that nonsense there. So people have fixed rate loans, very low interest, probably with a chance to refi, uh, under a 3% loan here in a in very short period of time. So the stability of the loan base is so much different than it was in 2008 and nine. So that's, that's what caused our problems. We had lots of people that didn't put a down payment, that didn't really qualify, and lenders were very aggressive until they figured out they were their own worst enemy. So right. you had foreclosures outpace sales in San Bernardino for an entire two years. Think about that. You're foreclosing on more homes than are selling. So how do you have price stability? You literally had 50, uh, for every $1,000 price increment in San Bernardino in 2009, you had 50 houses for sale. So you had 60, 60 grand houses, and there were 50 of them, and 50 houses at 61. Um, and they were 300 grand houses. We're not going to do that this time. Right. We're not going to foreclose in mass, even if people aren't making their payments, we're not going to do that because I think that's the lesson learned. They learned it pretty quickly when the inventory became uh, about 80% REOs in the MLS. So in Riverside and San Bernardino County, 80% of the M uh, MLS was filled with REOs. If they do that, if they say, okay, business as usual, everybody's not making their payment, uh, we're going to foreclose, you will have a replication, but they know that they can't do that. Right. So with property owners and homeowners now having equity in their properties and yeah. not being overextended and having very good loans with low interest rates, um, if we don't see the foreclosure system kick back in, that's going to have more stability. Now, the issue is what about price stability, median sales price? Now, right now, it's holding steady because there's very little inventory. Um, how do you see the inventory issue playing out over the course of the year because right now it's extremely tight and that's right. keeping prices strong. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, it, that kind of depends on California's ability to keep people here. So that's a migration question in a way. There's a, there's a lot of people that you kind of go, you know what? I'm not too excited about being here. So we're going to lose, we're going to lose a fair amount of people. Yeah. We'll probably send a lot of people somewhere else. That's, that's not the biggest factor, though. Um, the biggest factor is there seems to be a hesitancy to sell. So you, you may have people just keep what they have. They may refinance. Now, if you have a chance to refi, it's 2% something. You may never move. Right. So that, that literally may put a cap on how, many how much inventory you have to cope with at one time. You'll have people that maybe make a decision, I'm going to exit the state or I have to go where my new job opportunity is. But I don't see a rush to the exit in mass quantity like a, you know, an REO glut where you have 15 months of inventory and 80% of it is for sale by a lender. Uh, that's, that's not the kind of inventory that I see. But um, so I think, I think California might be more stable 
in price than we than we think. The the key is the unemployment rate and how do you get how do you get that to reset? And I don't know that that's going to be reset real quick. And I don't know if those people will get to stay in California and need to move somewhere else. You know, that's the interesting thing about Florida. Last house, last house I bought, uh, I built in Riverside. I had an eighty thousand dollar road, uh, excuse me, lot on a dirt road, and a permit that was fifty grand. And in Florida, I have a brand new house for that's about. It's cost me under two hundred grand. And so that's why that's why people go to other states is this so much more affordable. So I think that's it's going to be really interesting to see how much how much uh, people really want to stay in California. You know, right. that's the thing that you could lose a fair amount of people leaving. I think you will, but it could get excessive if they start pulling the wrong strings on new regulations. Correct. I also suspect that if prices do go down, that might cause more people who have equity in their property to make a move rather than see that equity erode over declining prices. They may say, well, I, I'm going to take my hundred thousand or $200,000 in equity before the market starts to erode any further and make a transition someplace, you know, buy down, move out of state or what have you. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, if you end up with a glut of inventory, you know, that's, that could impact price. But if you really just don't, you know, if you, pe if you have people willing to stay in place, um, you know, we've, California has always lost a pretty good percentage of people, according to things I look at a car, you know, when you have closings, and I, I forget the exact percentage, but it always seems like it's 25% people are leaving. So that's not, that wouldn't be completely new uh, news. But I think, um, you know, California's climate for business is not as friendly. So you could have, you could have companies, you know, really big companies decide, you know, what, we don't need a lot of office space. Look at what, look what you and I are doing. We've never done this before. So if right. you have a big company, maybe you don't have to own, you know, 5 million square feet of whatever. Maybe you can have people live wherever they want to. Right. And right. that'll be a, kind of an interesting transition for a lot of, a lot of employment. So this is, I mean, I'm listening to really smart people going, well, Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett has 40 some percent of his assets in cash because he does not know. Right. That's an interesting yeah. statement for a guy like that. Well, I, I, certainly. I mean, I, I watch all the, the, the pundits, the economists, all the experts, and I'm, I'm impressed with how many of them are cautious in their predictions. I mean, yeah. there, is, there is a level of unfamiliarity right now that has, you know, even the experts cautious because it's, there's a lot of unknown factors. You begin to touch on the commercial property side of it. Most of our membership, most of our uh, membership focuses on residential side, but this downturn and this transition of how people work, I think is gonna have a significant impact on commercial properties and how people view uh, their businesses and what they need from an employment and what they need from a commercial space standpoint as well. Absolutely, I think you could definitely see um, that segment take a hit as far as, well, I mean, some, some properties definitely are in, in the uh, crosshairs restaurants. Right. I mean, you know, uh, all those types of things that are the entertainment connected, like go to the movies. You know, we, we wouldn't think anything three months ago sitting next to somebody wanted to see a great movie and now we'll be going, well, right. <laughs> we want it to be 50% vacant or maybe even more. I mean, six foot, how, isn't that two seats away? So you've eliminated 66% of your audience to show a movie? Right. God that, forbid somebody, and God forbid somebody coughs or sneezes. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Then panic through the theater. Yeah, you know, so I, boy, you know, it's interesting. I, since I've had to travel so much in the last six weeks, thank God I really didn't have that mindset, but I'm constantly reminded that other people do. Because right. if you take your off your mask and just want to be normal, it's like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I'm going to hit some of the questions that came in. One of them came in from Brent Bistel, and he's asking, he says, CoreLogic is predicting a 5% increase in Inland Empire residential median sales price through 2021, or at least through April of 2021. Um, we touched a little bit about that already regarding maybe some lack of inventory that's going to keep prices pretty solid. 
uh, 5% increase over the next uh, year? Is that something you would think is going to happen? I would think I wouldn't have a clue. <laughs> and I, I'm really interested to know how they've concluded that um, yeah. because they think there's a lack of inventory. I'll tell you one thing that'll support price is the interest rates. So your payment per hundred grand. I mean, think about like a two and a half percent mortgage rate, which is really feasible in this next, in, in this year for every hundred grand you owe, that's a two, what, 210, $220 a month payment for interest. Yeah. That's bizarre. I mean, so that'll be supportive. Uh, it also will prevent inventory from showing up. People refine, just stay in place. Um, I would rather stay on the sidelines and watch than say, this is where we're headed for sure. If foreclosures were going to be created because people couldn't make payments and people without jobs don't make payments, then that prediction wouldn't survive at all. So, you know, that that's, they're basically saying that they know there's going to be no foreclosures and that they could be accurate, but I don't, I, I, I would, I would love to do an interview of that process myself and say, okay, tell me how you got there. Right. <laughs> right. So, how do you see the Inland Empire uh, and the housing market in the Inland Empire in any way different or in a better position or uh, a poorer position within the Southern California environment? I mean, if we had to look at our region separately, do you see any variations or something that might stand out for the local folks here that are working? You know, Mark, you may actually be more capable of this than I, but the job base that we have, we don't, we don't, we don't have a ton of 200 grand jobs, right? We're not a tech area We're we're more meat and potatoes that, you know, that type of thing. You work in restaurants and you work in retail stores and that type of thing. It would seem like our area would hurt worse to me. But we also have a disproportionate number of logistics jobs. And I think logistic jobs are strong right now. And I think they're going to continue to be strong over the next, well, years, forever, who knows? I mean, it's going to be a, a good area for us to be in. That, that part is true. Um, does, once again, this is out of my league in a way, but robotics taking the place of humans. Uh, I remember seeing an article one time, uh, and it was talking about the Inland Empire, that within 10 years, something like 60% of the jobs could be replaced by automation. Is, is, that, yeah. is that an accurate statement? I don't know, but I've, I've, I've seen some of that. There's a video on YouTube. It's been out for several years. It's called Humans Need Not Apply. It's about a 15 minute uh, long video and it's, it's compelling when you begin to look at artificial intelligence and what's happening on the employment side of it. Um, I've got a question here from someone. This is from uh, Sam and, and Eliza Offman. Question is, many buyers and sellers are standing on the sidelines waiting to see what happens. How long do you think this is going to last? Or what's a reasonable time frame for buyers and sellers to kind of sit out on the sidelines and wait for some clarity? Any idea on that one? You know, I guess everybody would have a reason on why they're waiting. Are they waiting because they didn't think they'd get a buyer? Or are they waiting because what they were looking to buy disappeared and didn't show up on the MLS so it got taken off? Yeah. Um, I think uh, there's a combination of that. You know, if they're going to leave, if they're going to leave the state, there wouldn't be any reason to wait. If they were going to relocate somewhere else, they may, uh, like when I took a look at the charts on your, on your weekly or monthly newsletter, you know, a lot of, a lot of listings didn't show up. So you may just not have the inventory that you go, okay, well, if I sell mine, what am I going to buy? So maybe this is just a, it takes a little while to hit the reset button for people to make that decision. I, you know, Again, this is not, I'm not connected to the retail side of the business, but literally if you have 25% on employment, what percentage of those were capable buyers or homeowners as opposed to renters and not, not capable of buying? Right. I bet it's disproportionately higher to people that are renters than homeowners, right. I would think. Yeah. What about builders? This is a question that came in from Rose Serta and she's asking, uh, I mean, have you been talking with any of the local home builders out here and how, what are they doing to position themselves right now? Are they, are they looking to ramp up? Are they looking, no. are, they, are they on hold? Where are they? Well, single family home building has never recovered in California. I mean, honestly, the typical, we had a really good run, right? In real estate for the last 10 years. Yeah. And, um, 
single family construction probably is at 35% of normal. Subdivision creation is at 35% of normal. That tells you the builders aren't interested in building in California because of uh, restriction, being able to get through a process successfully and know what the time frame is. There's a lot of uncertainty and so they, they just don't do it. So no, they're not intending to ramp up. I just looked at a report before this interview so I could be familiar with that. Uh, the projection is that it's gonna go down 20% that there's gonna be less building because builders are more nervous. And they just, if you go through a, a process of just getting a permit, much less a project, but if you have to get a project created, you know, you've got 20 acres of vacant land. Um, here's a funny story, true story. I used to have a lady that watched my dogs and she graduated college, got her master's. And she said, I can't watch your dogs this weekend. I have an assignment. I said, what is your assignment? She says, I'm going out to this remote area and I'm sitting in a, a guard, like a lawn chair with a high uh, powered camera. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, why, why are you doing that? And he said, there's a developer that's thinking of developing in this area and my job is to spot anything that's moving that might be, might be able to stop the project. Right. That was her work yeah. to see if there was a spotted whatever. <laughs> And you just go, wow. So if you're a developer, you can go bankrupt. And see, this, this kind of uncertainty doesn't spur on risk taking. Right. It, it does not. So you're gonna, have, you're gonna have a lot of projects just frozen in time. And the idea of starting something unknown that's gonna take two or three years to get to the finish line. Right. You'll have a pause button on that for quite a while. Now, What's nice about that in a way, it takes inventory away from competing with existing homes. Correct. That's absolutely a fact. Right, right. I suspect what'll happen on the new home construction, larger homes, more expensive homes are gonna be the ones the builders pull back on first because there's probably greater risk involved in, from a pricing standpoint, um, which may force them to build more affordable homes, smaller homes on smaller lots. But as you well know, and I was a planning commission in the county of San Bernardino for six years, communities don't like a lot of small homes on small lots. That makes them nervous. Um, they typically yeah, like and, big homes that are expensive and um, yeah, everything that and, goes with that. Yeah, and getting through that process. So you're, you don't really, you don't have a bunch of those types of lots in Riverside or anywhere else in California. So you, right. you're saying, okay, I'm gonna turn this parcel of land into this. Well, that's a lot of hoops and a lot of time in California. It and is. that's, that's what's discouraging. So in Florida, I mean, the process is now this is, uh, we build in an area around um, it's in South Florida, Southwest Florida, say there's a place called Rotunda West. Yeah. Uh, you're about three minutes away from four golf courses and seven minutes away from the ocean. And you got lots for sale for 10 grand. You go through the permit process in three weeks. I mean, you're just going, okay, yeah. it, that's like, it used to be here 30 years ago and it's not. So how we ramp up in construction in a time like this, there's no way. No, I, I understand. I have a question for you. Um, it says a few years ago, you held a seminar that was called All, All In or Fold. What would your title of today's <laughs> seminar be as it applies to Southern California real estate? You know, I was thinking, I was thinking of writing one. I keep on thinking. Now the last report was 2% mortgage rates and 40 trillion in debt. I thought that we might get there in about a 10 year period. Um, unfortunately, you'll have 2% mortgage rates and you will get to 40 trillion in debt. And that's not a prediction I would really want it to happen. If I had to write a title right now, it would be the great unknown. Yeah. I don't think, I think you have to sit there and go, okay, if I see this, then here's the, here's the path that's going to follow. I'd almost have to do one of those. I'd have to really think about, okay, if lenders are not allowed to be patient for a year and not get paid, that's a problem. So there's, there would be a series of checks and balances that I would have to say would have to be in place for there not to be uh, big, big problems. And it would make sense 
it would make sense not to. You know, one thing I'm uh, really not familiar with, but I became a little bit more familiar with, was that when somebody didn't make their payment to a lender, the servicer somehow had to make a payment. I, I was, haven't heard that. Yeah, there. Yeah, they were. They were literally going broke because a whole bunch of people stopped making payment, and there was like a big fiasco where the Fed had to come in and and do something to save all the servicers because they literally were going to go broke in two months. Uh, and I don't, again, I, I've already said more than I know about it, but I know that became a really big issue. So they have to, they have to protect systemically, not just the one homeowner. Apparently there can be big problems if, if we got aggressive and said, okay, it's business as usual, go ahead and foreclose or go ahead and evict. I mean, state of California right now, can you evict somebody? No, no? not short term. No, I mean, it's, it, no, not, not, no, the courts weren't even open yet. That's right. Right. Yeah. And it's going to be months before. So, you know, you have people that have payments on rentals. So yes. I don't know if the rules apply. So if you're a homeowner and it's Fannie Mae, you don't have to make your payment. There's sort of like a moratorium on that it gets tacked on the end. If you have a rental loan, I don't know if they, if they have the same policy. So if you're not collecting rent and you have a payment, you know, you may be the odd guy out. A lot of times uh, you kind of are. Right. Right. Let me just remind anybody who's participating right now, you can ask questions. Just go to the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type in your question for Bruce. And I will see if I can get that to him. Um, you talked about Florida. I mean, you obviously have been doing a lot of work there for the last, you know, what, five, 10 years? Oh, no. It's really concentrated on three years. Three years. Uh, I, okay. I put a lot of uh, rentals there myself. Yep. Okay. As far as national policies, do you have any idea? Have you heard anything? Or what would you suggest from a national policy standpoint? Realtors, we have meetings quite often. We had one yesterday with a local congressman. What are the types of national policies you think they should even be considering right now, given where we are with the housing market? Yeah, no, no brainer. Absolutely no brainer. You know, we talk about affordable housing. You have it. You have an interest rate that's going to start with a two. Yeah. You don't need anything else. Do a nothing <laughs> down loan. Do a nothing down loan to own a home. That would be huge for realtors for commissions. It would be huge for builders to build now. So here's the problem. Oh, well, they're going to have, let's say you have a 10% default rate, which would be really aggressive. Right. Because the payment would be less than rent in most areas at, at two and a half percent. Okay, so you're going to have 10% failure rate. Fine. Have a national foreclosure policy just on this loan type to where if you don't make payments for three months, it, it gets to go to sale for the late payments, not for the mortgage. No lender will lose a dime. The, the na nation won't lose a dime. You'll have a 2.5% mortgage rate for, with an opening bid of, what, three grand? Right. Is that, is that possibly going to go back to the lender ever? No it would be bought by someone like you or me that wants it a rental or somebody else that wants to live in it. There's no way you'd have a foreclosure. Your home ownership rate in the nation would go over 60% and you would create activity for real estate. It's the no brainer decision. It just really is. I agree. And if you look at even VA loans with a 1% down payment, right. the default rate is extremely low. That's right. They cause, they, they do some, now they do good qualifying as far as reserves and stuff like that. This is a national emergency folks, period. You have to, you're going to do all kinds of other things. Sometimes we did an $8,000 tax rebate, right? So you were induced to buy one in 2009 and 10. You don't have to induce anybody to get a two and a half percent fixed mortgage rate. And by the way, if that saves them money every month beyond rent, I have rentals, so I'm, I'm shooting myself in the foot, but I really don't care. What I'm saying is, I mean, if you're in Florida and you're buying a 200 grand home at two and a half, well, you're, you just probably saved half of your cost of housing. Well, that means you'll be able to afford uh, other stuff. That's right. really smart for the economy. And it's a once in a lifetime deal. Let's say we have this interest rate for two years. When you sign up for that, you have a 30 year benefit. It changes the American economy for decades. It makes people proud that they live and they own something. There's a difference in that. You, all of this society problems is there's haves and there's have nots. Fine. Let people have, let them, let them have the right to own something with nothing down. If they let us down, 
hey, you know what? Maybe circumstances were, were tough and, they, and so what? Okay, buy one. It means you can't qualify for another one for a while, but it doesn't mean you can't show up at a trustee sale and buy one with three grand or five grand and get, get it back, right? right? This is the easiest policy decision to solve such a huge amount of problems. And I, I completely agree. I, and, and this idea of having uh, entry level homes and, and the opportunity for people to buy homes is essential. And, you know, it's obviously when you own a house and the equity keeps going up, it feels great, right? You're making money on your house and you're not really doing it, much. It's a cushion. But, you, but, but th there's such a difference between, I mean, 65 and over, when you look at median net worth, it's completely scary if you don't own a home. I yeah. mean, you're, you're at the edge of homelessness constantly. Really, you're, you know, you got 20 grand net worth. You're, you're one physical event away from being homeless. Yeah, so it lends, it, it lends a lot of pride to say you own a home, your equity goes up so you have a cushion. Um, maybe even you get an equity line and you start to be entrepreneurial. It's a big deal, we have a chance to do that. We can, we can take advantage of this. We don't need affordable housing, we have it. We don't have to subsidize it with government money. We, right. we have it subsidized already. Good grief. Right. I'll go wherever you want, Mark. Let's go, let's go yell at Congress, man. <laughs> I love it. Okay, I got a question here from Mr. D. Wayne Mortensen. Um, he's talking about the last downturn. He asked a question regarding how the, the role that investors played in kind of pulling the market back up. What role do you see for investors this time around? Or do you see a role for investors to play? In this, uh, in this economy? You know, I think the role that investors will play is buying, you know, it's interesting. So we have a hard money loan business that's, that's grown in the last three months because investors have been able to find deals. So you have somebody that's, you know, they want to make a quick decision and they, maybe they have a fixer upper, they don't have the ability to fix it. So that's become more prevalent. People have gotten rid of some of the stuff they were afraid of. Right. The role that investors played was much less than it could have as far as individual investors. So I went back to Washington, D.C. three times during that downturn, spoke with Fannie and Freddie and uh, FHA. One about this loan program years ago, you yeah. know, and uh, but a lot of it was solved, if you will, by selling the a large quantity of homes to hedge funds. Right. And hedge funds bought a lot of properties at the trustee sales and that type of thing. So the bigger players were a dominant role in supporting the price because they didn't have the idea, they didn't have the model of reselling it for a profit. They had a cash flow number. So they just had to meet that. They had to meet a cap rate and then they could buy it. So that was very supportive. I don't think there'll be a tolerance for foreclosing on people that lost their job to no, no fault of their own and no history of missing payments. I think there's really going to be patience with that, which is really smart. Right. I think you're going to foreclose on 25% of the nation's houses. That, that's stupid. Right. So let, let me ask you that question then. It, you talked about the large hedge fund and corporate investors that came in and bought properties. They've basically held those properties as rental properties. Yep. And I suspect a lot of those people that are renting may not be making their payments. Do you see them beginning to kind of shed some of their inventory and put those out in the market for sale by owner? Oh, you know, it's an interesting question because, you know, that's one thing we do have a finger on the pulse. So we have a lot of loans that are with people that have rentals. 100% mm -hmm. are paid current. I have a lot of rentals. 100% of my tenants are paying. Um, uh, tomorrow I'm doing an interview with an apartment called apartment dealer, uh, Chris German. He has clients that own, own hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of units. 95% of them are paying rent. So this is overblown as far as I'm concerned about how many people are not paying rent. Okay. So, so to answer your question, the big companies are probably experiencing similar percentages. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them really don't have business models that are set up for sale. They're sort of in a sort of like a scattered REIT. So instead of owning apartment building, they own a thousand homes. Right. That's still in an entity that the intention is to keep and, and go along. Yes. Yes. Okay. I understand. Okay. If it's any other questions, folks, hop on the Q&A, type it up, and we will ask Bruce. Um, 
on the mortgage side, I mean, rates are historically low. Do you see, I mean, do you really think it's going to go lower or is it just going to hold at 2% or where we are right now? Well, where are we now? Are we in twos? I don't, I mean, it's, it's hovering. It's gotta be, yeah, it's yeah. gotta be right around there. Yeah. I don't see any strength in it going up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, there's no way. So yeah, I think you could, I think you could get into the mid twos. Yeah. Um, at some point it almost doesn't matter. It's so cheap monthly. And what's such a, I mean, such a big deal is that it's a 30 year benefit. You could have a window for six months benefit 30 years of our country. That's an astonishing thing to think about when you talk about affordable housing, you know, again, don't think about the cost of it. Think about the monthly cost of it. That's really what matters. So everywhere in the country has affordable housing right now. Well, how do you get people in it? You, you just say, don't need, you don't need a down payment. Well, we're going we're gonna to run the risk of seeing if you want to own something right. that saves you half of your monthly cost. How, how hard is that to make a decision you want one? And what would that do the economy? You want to see Florida go nuts in building? I would do it, right? I mean, that would completely do right. it. Well, that's a, that's a big deal. It is a big deal. And it's, it's, a, it's a message that we need to begin to communicate as an industry to policymakers. I, can, I remember about nine years ago, we had a meeting with a local congressman. This was during the downturn, obviously, about 2010, 11. And his biggest complaint to us when he talked about housing was that home buyers didn't have enough skin in the game. And his position was, if you don't have a 20% down payment, then you shouldn't be able to buy a house. And we literally had to walk him through the process and talk about VA loans and FHA loans and the default rates. But his, his perception was such that it was completely off base. The fact is, it's all about installment payments. If you can make the payments, you can be the homeowner. And that's really what the emphasis should be. Right. And, if it, oh, and by the way, if, if your rent is twice what your payment would be for owning? Yeah. What happens to the extra money? Oh, it probably gets spent in the economy or it provides an education for your kid or you get rid of your debts and you pay them and on and on. I mean, that's, that's, we have a chance. We have a chance to hit the reset button on our society. A lot of this, a lot of this disgruntledness is because it's not, it hasn't been very fair in some, in some things. We could do this. We could literally turn a lot of people from renters to owners with no risk to the, what he's concerned about is the systemic risk. Oh my God, Fred, Fanny and Freddie are going to foreclose on a bunch of houses. Well, no, you're not. You're not going to foreclose on one of them because the opening bid is the late payment, not having anything to do with the principal. Principal rolls to the next owner. And I mean, there'll be 25 buyers per every house that have an interest rate of two and a half percent. Come on. Yeah. Matter of fact, let an overbid occur and let it float to an insurance policy that ensures the whole shoot and match. It's, it's the only way. I mean, I was around when interest rates, when I refied my house in 1981 to become an investor, it was 17 and a half. And the journey down, you know, I thought 12. Well, I got to refi at 12. That was <laughs> exciting. You know, when you're talking about anything below five, it's a miracle. And now below three, yeah. the country needs to have somebody there with enough knowledge to say guys we're going to take this risk because it's worth it because it's so important to jobs so realtors escrow title builders all those people are going to be slammed with new business you're going to take a guy with an attitude as i hate being a renter and it's going to say 500 bucks being an owner that's a big deal home depot is going to go yeah yeah this is a big deal and we have a chance to do it. And you can't let these people that don't know what the heck they're talking about say, Oh, we got to have 20% down. No, you don't. You have to prevent foreclosures. That's what you're thinking happens at 20% down. Well, that isn't necessarily what happens. You've had a 50% decline. Why? Cause you had loans that only had a choice to foreclose and they glutted the marketplace with have to sell inventory. So right. don't do that. Create this loan program. Once in a lifetime, two years, three years, let's get that thing up to 60%. When you have a failure, no big deal. It goes to somebody else. I mean, that's a brilliant idea. It just has to have somebody that's knowledgeable go, you know what? We're going to do it. Right. Yeah, the risk really isn't there. I agree. No. <laughs> so 
you talked about earlier, you talked a little bit about um, potential out migration within California, from California to other states. Um, the Inland Empire has historically been a recipient of in-migration right. from LA and Orange County, and even San Diego to some extent on the southern part of Riverside. That's so right. Charlotte McKenzie asked the question, how do you see the, the Inland Empire positioned here within Southern California from an in-migration standpoint? That will continue. I mean, that's the thing about, you know, Orange County and LA, they get pricey and you just go, you know, I, I made that move myself a long, long time ago. I was renting in Orange County, you moved to Riverside, owned a house for a hundred bucks less than my rent. That was in what 19, you know, way in the seventies, but that's the, that's what, why people do it and why they people want to drive on the freeway. Um, so I think, I think an inland empire has that safety net. I, I don't know about, the types of jobs we have being secure from progression of um, Unemployment. robotics and all of the technical advances and things like that. California is a, a great place to live. I mean, I've, I've really thought about not living here for the taxes, you know, for things like that. But you, you know, you have people here that you, you love and that's one of the reasons you stay, right? Your relatives and all that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I forgot exactly what the, no, I think an inland empire has a natural, landing spot and without the foreclosures you know, see that was what the price hit was all about we had 80 percent in one year 2009 80 percent of sales were reos well don't let's don't do that okay right. <laughs> that right. doesn't right. make any sense right so i have a question here from mr jeff story he's asking besides florida um are there any other states that you would recommend to look at from an investment standpoint you know i try to choose the best one Okay. okay, so I don't, I, I'm going to eliminate other 48, not because I'm not knowledgeable, but I'm really not because I didn't look. And here's why I didn't look. Florida is going to be the recipient of massive, I mean, they already are, but now it's going to be on steroids. They get their migration from New York and New Jersey. Okay, game over. There's going to be so many people move from those, those states to Florida, it's not going to be funny. But there's going to be massive amounts of, of money from California go to Florida. They don't send people there. They send people to Texas and Arizona and Nevada and all that. Their money though, a lot of it will land in Florida, which is a very, very smart decision because Florida is the number one um, state for uh, statewide migration. So, and then number two in immigration, about to be number one in immigration. So you literally are the landing place Right. for the country and for the world, for our nation. Well, well, I, when I look at charts and say, where's migration going? That's where my money I want. Correct. That's right. it. That's, that's all I need to know. So I don't need to check out the other 48 states. California loses the most people and Florida gains the most people, which is why all, most of my money went there to hold rentals as opposed to in California. I just, that's why I did it. What is the, the price range for the single family detached product in, in some of the areas of Florida you're looking at? From a comparable standpoint, California is probably 20 or 30% more expensive for a very similar product. No, it's a, no, it's hundred percent more. Oh, really? Oh, no, it's hundred percent more. I mean, you can buy a, a brand new 1600 square foot house. You're a retail buyer now. You can buy that for 230 grand. Wow. Brand new. Yeah. And you're, and you're seven minutes from the ocean. Yeah. That's attractive. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it's, that's what, that's, you know, when you retire, I mean, there was somebody in Orange County, we had a guy that bought a house from somebody in Orange County. They bought it for a hundred grand. It was worth a million two. The investor bought it for a million. These people went to Florida. Well, they had a million dollars of equity. It wasn't doing them anything really in California. Now they, they spent 250 grand on a, nicer house than they had in Huntington Beach and had 750 grand left over to live. That's right. not a hard decision. Yeah. Yeah. I know Aaron, your son does a lot of work and, and research and commentary on accessory dwelling units, ADUs. Are you very involved in that? And if so, maybe you can kind of share some of your thoughts on where you see that going. No, you know, I, I haven't been involved in it because I've been more involved in Florida as far as construction. But what Aaron did is really become the expert for the state, in my opinion, on that. And yes. so uh, he's been very involved in it and has met with the people that created the legislation. Also, 
has informed him of when cities were, you know, kind of lining up going, oh, okay, wow, this is a great opportunity for us to charge fees and all that and delay the process or say no to it. Aaron was very involved in getting that back to the senator where they came over the top and said, okay, well, it's really a state approval now instead of a, a local approval, which is, right. you know, why they, why they wanted it. They wanted to get this done. So I know we have, we certainly have some investors that are, are doing that, especially in areas like, um, that are more expensive. That's, that's definitely LA, San Diego. Uh, I know that that's going on now. You know, one thing we haven't talked about, and I don't know, I don't know how many homes are involved, but Airbnb type stuff. Yeah. I mean, that, that has to be a real shocker to that, that world. Because I know people that are investors basically, basically calculate what am I getting for income? That means I can pay this much for it. So, right. uh-oh, if you just turned your Airbnb rental that could be rented per day to a monthly rental, that's, that can be a problem. I, I don't know how much inventory is going to come out of that, but there might be a lot of people that say, I don't want to own it for that purpose anymore and have some inventory come from that. I just don't know what the numbers are. Right, right. Um, well, we're about 50 minutes into our conversation with Mr. Bruce Norris. We're going to wrap it up here in a few minutes. If you have any final questions to ask Bruce, please hop on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and submit the question. Um, there were a couple of questions that were asking what part of Florida uh, you were talking about. And it basically, it was what, the Southwest area? Yeah, you know, and I'm not an expert on Florida. That would be shameful for me to tell you okay. that I am. I'm not. I own rentals, and it was accidental. So, you know, some of the things you do, you kind of get, you get into. I was going to interview the chief economist of Fannie Mae in the first quarter of 2015, and uh, Doug Duncan. So i preparing for that talk or that interview. I read their financials for 2014, fourth quarter, and it said 25% of Fannie Mae's losses came from one state, Florida. So I thought, wow, okay, there's got to be, back in 2014, I looked at, and it turned out Florida had a four-year foreclosure process. So they weren't in 2014, they were in 2010. Yeah. Okay, well, that, that put a smile on my face because I know what to do with that. So I called a buddy of mine up, and I said, let's, let's poke around and buy the remaining lots in a tract. And so I did, it happened to be in Leesburg. Well, I didn't know Leesburg from the, from the, you know, the moon. It turns out that my lots are within a few minutes of a place called the Villages. Well, the Villages is a big deal for seniors to go to, which creates lots and lots of need for nurses and doctors and facilities, medical facilities. 100% of my renters are nurses. They're very well employed. I have yeah. nobody ever even late. So that was an accidental uh, benefit. Um, now, that's not where we're doing a lot of building now. We're doing it in Cape Coral area. Um, but why? Because it's the number one migration for the country. That's why. I, so that's the chart I pay attention to. Are people showing up? Are they going to likely continue to show up? And now I think many more are going to show up. Right. Speaking of charts and data, if you could point to our members and tell them to look at two or three points of data to help them understand and anticipate where we're going as an economy or where the market's going, what do you suggest they look at? Oh my gosh, you know, it's, it's different now. Yeah. So everything that I know from 30 years of looking this, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily look at the same charts. Okay. I would look at unemployment. I mean, that's... Um, that's leading the way, and it only took two months to get there. Yeah. That's a very significant chart now, and how, how that improves. The number of foreclosures is really important, you know, and the patience of the, of the system to say it's okay not to pay your payment. Right. Uh, that's really important. And the foreclosures in California will have to follow a path. So you could be, if they started foreclosure tomorrow, you'd probably be a year away from an REO, would be my guess. Yeah. So nothing urgent is going to happen with that inventory, but that's a really key number. Uh, I would say migration. I would, I would pay attention to how many people are exiting. Very good. Okay. And you know what? And how to okay. stop that is what you and I have been talking about. You give California two and a half percent mortgage where people can buy it without 
not without qualifying, but without a down payment. Sure. Right. Yeah. You qualify, don't put a down payment. That would be a game changer. People could own here and they would. That's a great idea. All right, folks, Bruce, I want to thank you again. You've been a, a, a fantastic supporter and participant and speaker on issues in our industry. I just want to thank you for taking time out of your morning and sharing with, uh, with the members of Ivar. And um, please tell Aaron hello when you see him as well. Okay. All right, Mark. I look forward to uh, the future. I think it's going to be a very interesting balance of the year and going into 2021. But I think there's a lot of potential, and I'm not forecasting in any way gloom and doom. It's going to be different. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be horrible. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity as things evolve on the economy and in the housing industry itself. I think you would, by changing the policy of lending, you would push people to own and make a decision. Right now, it's easy to stay on the fence. Yeah. But if that was an opportunity that had a window, then, wow, we'd be off to the races. It would be such a big help. So, hey, if, if you and I can go talk to somebody that can say yes to that, I'm all in. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Bruce. Have a great day, and we'll talk soon. Okay, Mark. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Bye -bye. All right.